And the church said? Yes. So the topic of fatherlessness and fatherhood is a national crisis. And this morning, as we come to the conclusion, I want to help us recognize, and it's sad for me, because I feel like the Lord has taken me back when I am coming to conclusion. Because there's a lot of things and a lot of things that I'm seeing in the text that if we are to become a better society, we need to be able to address. When men are messed up in a society, they create up, a messed man creates a messed up family. So we need to help the men deal with their issues. And this morning, under a subsection, I want to talk about men matters. If you are a man, you are here, I want to tell you, you are important. I know a few people tell you that. And I want to urge you this morning, I know women have thought that they are the most wanted people. I don't think that's true. Or, or maybe they are wanted. Let's correct the language here. Men are the most needed people on planet Earth. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Women may be wanted, or, yeah. but men are needed. Yeah. This guy there, it's important. We need to reaffirm the position of the men in our nation, in our homes, everywhere. A male man is an important person. God's strategy of building nation is based on that guy. I've made a very strong quote, you may want to like it, is that everyone wins when a man gets better. We all win. When men get better, we all win. And women are already there. You know, even when women get better, things get better, but not everyone win when a woman gets better. And for, for God's sake, women are here. They are present. They are present in the home. There is no son, there is no, no daughter who is struggling with the absence of a mother. But when fathers and men become better, we all win. I think we need to help men to recognize that they are so important that when they are not there, life is not good. We may claim it is because we are just into the circumstances where, they are, where men are not there. But that's not the ideal picture that God has created. And I have said this at the beginning of this message. We have been saying it, that women suffer the most when men are absent. Because as a woman, you would suffer from your, the absence of your father who has left you. And, and, and you, know, you know a man, a male man is important to the growing up of the girl child. Because a male man is the first love of the girl child. So the girl child learns how to love a male man by loving his father or, or her father. So when a, when a father is absent, she gets lost. This is why 71% of teenage pregnancy are coming from families where the father is not there because these girls do not know who to take their love to. They meet thugs, street boys, and men who do not have a sense. They take advantage of them. Now we have teenage pregnancies. So girl children need a father in the home. And, and if he's absent the second time, then you meet this guy who you think you love. Because you don't have a clue of how, what it means to love a male man. And this male man too does, he has been left by a father. Two people, both of them, don't know what is fatherhood. And then this wife expects you to father her. And also to father her children. And this male man has been abandoned by his father. Have no clue of what fatherhood is. And he struggles with seeing this woman with bright eyes and colored hair and doesn't know what to do. And they are all in a place they have never been. It's a crisis. And the woman says, I need this, I need this. And the man doesn't know how to give those things because he has never been fathered. And I can take it, extend it. So women suffer the most. From having no father to be married to a guy who doesn't understand any clue about fatherhood, fails them, fails the children, and they're in a bad position. So this subject is important to all of us. And as men, we need to know we matter because we create problems. 
We matter because when we move the wrong direction, the family moves the wrong direction, the children move the wrong direction. Everyone suffers when a man suffers. So I think there is this mainly issue, no, I'm alone, no, I'm the big guy, no, I'm, no, you're not alone. When you make errors, it spreads across. And as we get into this text this morning, my objective, and I've said it alone, it is not to condemn anyone, but it's to tell every male man we can do better. It's to encourage every male man you can pick up where you have lost it and go the right way. Because things would never be right when men are in the wrong place. I've shown the statistics here about South Africa and about other nations where we see that in South Africa, 31.6% of black children live with their parents. And 86.1 of Asian children live with their families. See them in the future. The future of a black child can never become prosperous than the nation where a child is being groomed by both parents. And the starting point is for men to own up, raise their children, be there for their children. And I know this message is very sensitive. I know this message wraps the wrong way. And it's not even easy for me to be preaching it to you. But if we are to get things right, this is the starting point. Children need both parents, and both parents need to be accountable. And I'm taking you to the text. Genesis chapter number one. Not number one, number three. It is the story that you know, but I want us to use a very strong anthropological perspective on the text so that we can extrapolate some of the things that are important to us in this context. Last week I told you, God's word is timeless. In other words, God speaks once, and that message should become relevant throughout the generation. He spoke thousands of years ago. Today you and I are here in the church because God's word, his, which he spoke then, is still relevant to us. The skill or the tool of contextualization help us to go into a story in the Bible that was spoken then, and then to extrapolate or deduct or take out things that are timeless in that story and make them relevant to us. And that's how I want us to go into the story of today's word. In the chapter, scholars of the Bible label it the fall of a man. What happened when men fail. And today we are talking to fathers. What happens when a father falls? That's what we want to deal with. So we are looking at this man who met us and we are going into the story. The idea is, can we find out what happened? And I want us to read uh, the text. For the scripture says, for God does know. So this is the snake. It's speaking to the woman. The snake says, for God knows that in the day in which you eat, then your eyes will be opened and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, I think we are going to talk about God's purpose for fatherhood, for, for, for motherhood. It has to come. Because look at when, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for what? For food. Because women are always deceived by sight. And I know how psychology has tried to put it like that feeling, but women too are deceived by sight. And the women know that better. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. In the subject, the verb. Let me not talk. And the tree to be desired to make what? One wise. She took of the fruit therefore and did eat and gave also to the husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them were both what? Opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves approach. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Very interesting Hebrew there. The voice of the Lord is walking. The voice. It's not God there. In the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife did what? Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called in the garden, in the garden, okay, no. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? 
Say that with me. Where are you? I want to stop there. And that's my subject for today. One of the most fundamental questions that I want to ask you today is the most popular question in the world. And I'm going to justify it to you. The most popular question being asked today is this question. Men, where are you? This question was asked thousands of years ago by God. And we are being anthropological. We are bringing the text to the people. Today, this question has descended from God's thinking and God's answering to God, to men asking themselves this question about one guy, the most wanted man. A male man. I wanted to title this message, Wanted, Dead or Alive. <laughs> yeah, because if there is anyone that everyone is looking for, it's a man. Go into the counseling room. There are girls and boys who are crying and say, I want to know who my father is. Otherwise, you can even take me to the grave where he died. Let me see it so that at least... I can have closure. This man is wanted, dead or alive. So the question, where are you, is a very important, is a very important question. And everyone is looking for the male. And I want to justify you and help you come in contact with the text. Why the question, where are you, men, is important. And I want to show you different groups. I think I'll go up to five because I went that far in the morning series. But I can go up to nine or ten different categories of people that are asking themselves men where are you because they see a place in their life that no woman no money no milk no peanut butter no margarine no mayonnaise can fill this place in their life needs a man and every time they encounter realities that makes them say where are you weak Mwari, where are you? Uh, Raditongo Tonko, where are you? <laughs> Whoever you are, where are you? And here's the first category of people that are asking themselves, where are you, mate? First group is the married women. And I want to start with this group because it's the, like, it's the least likely group to be asking the question. We assume that most married women sitting next to their husband, sleeping to their next to their husband, have not asked themselves this question. But get closer, you would hear a woman sitting next to her husband says, where is the guy I got married to? Where is he? He'll be looking at you with eyes, teary, not being so clear to you, but deep down in his heart he says, where is the emotional guy I got married to? Where is the soft guy I got married to? Where is the caring man that I loved? Where is he? Because men can be absent when they are physically present. And they need somebody who can call them in. Because I'll show you in the text. One of the problems is that men, when they, when they hear a call, they want to run away. Look at the text. The text says, God was coming and he's asking Adam, where are you, Adam? And it's so interesting. I don't have the time to deal with that. But a very strong textual criticism reveals that God, I mean, two people have just done a mistake. Actually, not two people. It's one person. The woman have just sinned. <laughs> let's, let's, let's read the text well. Let's be fair. The woman have just did what? Eaten the fruit. The fruit was eaten by a woman. And the woman took it to a man. Yeah. No, let's, let's agree with the Bible, please. Please. The, the person who sinned is the woman. He took the fruit and gave it to a man. It's in the Bible. It's written that way. But what surprises me is the shock of our time. That God seen that is the woman who first ate, he's not calling for Eve. When he shows up in the garden, he says, Adam, where are you? And I think we miss it as male species. 
to recognize that the text embraces themes. And the theme in this discussion is a delegated authority represented a delegated accountability. God never spoke to the woman, and we need to bring that back to the family and back to the nation. God spoke to the man, and when he comes back, he's not asking the person whom he has not spoken to. He speaks to the man. Where are you that these things are happening? He demands that accountability from a male man. And it's sad, and I know nowadays we want to individual, individualize things, but I want to say it as it is. If you are a real man who is going to make a real impact, you are accountable for it when it is good, and you are accountable for it when it is bad. God demands that you become accountable for the results of your family. Even when the woman has gone wrong. One of our problems is we have a lot of men that are sissies. No, the woman is doing this, the woman is doing this, or no, I'm doing this. It's never like that. And I can tell you, let's make noise. Let's form a mambana. Let's do whatsoever. Things are never going to get right until men are going to become accountable even when they are not wrong. Can I say it again? I can see you, you are not sure about it. You are not sure about it. Let's, let's bring it. This, this is God's way. This is a model that we see. God is speaking to the man because the man is the authority. We have a problem today. People want authority but no accountability. Men wants to say I'm the head. Politicians want to say I have the power. But when you hold them accountable, no one wants to do it. If you want authority, like accountability. These are two beds they fly together. Allow them to flock together. Let us not want it when it is one of the primary problems today in modern families. So son of God, it right. Men do not want to be asked, where are you? Baby, where are you? Yeah. No man wants to be asked that question. Actually, in such an etymological understanding, we, a man is not asked, where are you from? They don't like this question. It's not the beginning. Adam, their grand, grand, great father, started the game. When he was asked the question, he's dodging. Read the story. The guy cannot even, we are going to read the text. Adam is never going to tell us where he is. Read the story. So when you meet a man and this man never tells you, please don't get so shocked. They are like that. The question of how are you is a difficult question to the, male, to the male man. And this is why the male man needs help. Because when he hears this question, he feels like he's being attacked. And in the scripture, God is coming to help. Because he understands, if you are in this place, Adam, you are in danger. I'm coming in to come and save you. The problem with women is that sometimes when they ask the question, they are ready to attack. And if you are ready to attack, he's ready to run away. So bring him in. Don't attack the place where he is in or where he is coming from. Very important. Men gravitate towards a place of calmness. So he can leave your house because he feels you are making noise. It's a wrong decision for him, but we need to understand him. And that's why we are speaking to him today. But we need to help you. And, don't, and to, to say that God holds men accountable does not also mean that women should just do things and then think that God is going to hold men accountable. You, can I show you from the text? Eve has had problems since then of doing wrong that the accountability lied on Adam. And when we, when, when we do things that are wrong and they pushes men to hold their accountability, here's the problem. We're going to deal with men that are running away from God. And a man that is running away from God is too dangerous and too difficult to keep. Because every man's testosterone needs to be injected with divinity for it to become mild. And you don't have that tablet. So don't keep him for yourself. Don't push him. You are best with him when you allow him to be in the presence of God. 
So you reduce the things that can make that are wrong or that makes him to do wrong so that he stays under the presence of God. So that's the first type of people we need to understand. Women today are crying for their men while they're with them. I've been in the counseling room. Most of the prayers of wives is, Lord, touch my husband. Touch my husband. Work in my husband. And that's a, that's a good prayer. But I want you to recognize as a man, somebody is crying for your sake. Can you make yourself better? Can you work on yourself? Can you improve on your mistakes? Can you recognize that when you are not doing things well, you are affecting other people? That's the call. God says, where are you? Wake up. When you don't wake up, you are causing other people to experience pain. The second type of group of people that are affected by this, they're asking themselves the same question. Man, where are you? A single mothers. Single mothers bore children. They called them sons. They celebrated that. Other than the guy, the fact that actually single mothers mourn twice. They mourn for the guy who left. And they mourn for the son who leaves. I don't know whether I'll be able to explain that very well. But I want to show you that single mothers, single parents are crying. They are asking themselves, one, where is the man who gave birth to this boy? And sometimes it becomes double the pain because even the boy leaves, stays in the city, get married to a beautiful woman and forget the mother. And the mother is in the village, traumatized by the fact that he met a certain guy who lied some years back to say, I can be here for life, and then left. And then that guy gave him a son. He had hoped that the son would save him. Now the son has left, got entangled with another woman, and is no longer checking on him. This single mother, single parent is crying, oh God. This was my hope. After the hat that came from the father who left, now the son has left. And this is a very important message to women who, who are married to men. Don't keep the men for yourself. The parent needs the man. The best way to make sure that you also keep your man is not to take him away, completely away from his family. Allow him to visit the family, to check where he's coming from. And the same applies to men. Don't seek to take the woman to yourself. He is too hot. He needs other people to cool her down for you. Allow her to go home. Let the mother cool her down. And when she comes back to you, She's better. Don't get the man for yourself as a woman. Allow her to get home. Let the mother do what? Inject her, calm her down. When he comes home, he's better. So we need, we need to understand, single parents, single mothers are crying. And this is why it's important for us to keep working relationship with our mothers because majority of us come from families of single parents and now we have abandoned them. It's a wrong. And it causes them to come. The third group comes from children. Your child is crying as a man. I mean, and I've just said it when I began this message. Your daughter is calling for you. She's asking herself, where's my first love? And, and the mother is first with traumatizing circumstances to answer about where is the whereabouts of the father. And how are I am. So no one can tell where you are. And this young girl, day in and day out, has to struggle with the question, where is he? What is he doing? Is he thinking about me? Does he care about where I am? And the boy child, your son, is also thinking about it. Says, where's my dad? 
I want my dad. I want to be like my dad. You see, God has, and, and this is very important, God has planted a deception. A deception within children to idolize parents as a process of parenting. It's a very important model. It's a biblical tool. Psychologists have come to discover it today through your cementation processes and so forth and so on. This is why when you are dead and your child is still idolizing you before he sees your mistakes, that's the time for you to teach him the right things. Because he thinks you are God. He thinks you are the master of everything. He thinks you are the man, but we know you. Uh, but your son would say, I know my dad. When my dad comes here, my dad can knock you down. But we know we can knock you down easily. <laughs> so be thankful. Somebody believes in you. Don't let him down. That's the time to build him in. Build it in. Build in it. I'm your call. And most men miss that opportunity. Your child loves you as a girl. She loves you. She's cunning after you. And you're continuously rejecting her. Later on in the year, she says, hey, hello, baby. She says, hello. Ah, what are you saying? And you're gone. Because once they reach the cementation stage, they can never accept you. You're gone. And that's the problem of the dead. You're going to die alone. I can give you statistics. Statistics shows that men die early, men die alone. I don't have the numbers, but it's there, even in the country here. Because of resentment of the kids that should be bearing you. So children, both sons and daughters, are crying. Where's my dad? Is he dead? Because women would say, no, you know the train came and took him and whatever. Which train? Where was it going? And that complicates the problem. Can we go and see his grave? And the woman doesn't know. Gentlemen, you met him. And we can't live life without men. And when men get into the way, things become better. And I can tell you more. Pastors, pastors also asking the question, where are men? Yeah, I needed, I needed to bring myself into the text. Yeah, because I live it. When, when you are a pastor and you are seeing women doing things that men should be doing, you wonder, where are men? Where are men? Why should I lead with women? Because the church is being meant to be led by men. That's my version. Yeah, but, and, and I'm maintaining it. And, and that's part of the problem today. That pastors are surrounded with women. And it's a wrong equation to surround men with women. It's a wrong equation. Because there are no men. So pastors are asking, where are men? And the women are pulling the men. Can we go to church? It's a wrong equation. The men should be saying, baby, let's go to church. Let's go to the house of God. This is my pastor. The, past the men speaking. This is my pastor. The men. Not the woman pulling the men. This is my pastor. <laughs> so pastors are wondering, where are the men? Why should I be building with women? Where are the men? Governments are crying too. You know the guy who wrote the, the, the national anthem here said to the men, can you at least wake up? Yeah, because we can't build nations without building the men. This is why I'm saying to you, when a man stands, we all get better. One of the problems of our government is lack of real men. We have a lot of sissified men. That's my version of English. Sissified, pacified, whatever you want, to, you want to name it. We need real men who can take care of their families, who can take care of their children, who can go out and make things happen. I mean, it's so annoying. It seems as if it is natural to see women struggling to make things happen. Women working so hard in a place where the body that was built to do that, sitting on a couch, reading about war in Iraq, where men are fighting, and it's failing to fight for the family. <laughs> it's, 
Real men should stand. But I want us to understand, schools are crying. I've been a teacher before. One of our problems was that men never come to take reports for their children. And I don't have statistics for that, but I can tell you that families where the father is involved in the education of the children, the children do better. And there's a very strong, different psychological environment when you are giving a feedback to a student in the presence of the father than when the mother is there. Completely different scenarios. And ask teachers, ask schools, when men come to ask and hear about children perform better when they know my dad is going to be coming here. He's going to be asking, am I doing things well? Am I committed? But our men relegate such responsibility. This is your child. Go, go and check. Now I'm busy. Busy making money. And sometimes you never see that money. <laughs> if at least the money was coming, it will be better. <laughs> I need some bodyguards after this service. <laughs> yeah, I think I need them. Yeah, I think I need them. So, so everyone is in need of a father. Life gets better, things get better when the father is there. But I want us to ascend into the text and identify the place where this guy is. The guy does not tell us in the text. He refuses to answer. Even when God is asking him, Adam, where are you? Read the text, go and study it on your own. He never says, God, I am next to the blue tree. He never. He never says, God, I am right in the middle. You see, 90 degrees from this, or I am on the east, south, west of the garden. Or whatever. He never says that. He never says, oh, no, I'm sitting next to the river of Ephrates, uh, right by the, the blue tree. He never. This guy. But I want us to get into the text to identify his location. Here's the first thing that surprises me. Genesis 3 verse number 7. I want us to read that text so that you can see the transition. He says, so, so this is his response. Can you imagine? Where are you? <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> At the moment, okay, no. It's, okay, no, this, 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 this describes the process. I think that is in verse number 7, but I want to number 9. So, so when God says, where are you? He says, when I heard your voice, I was afraid. Uh, that's his answer directly to that. But let's look at the process that the text tells us about him before he answers so that we can identify where he is. This is what he says. Now let's go back. Sorry. Let's go back to, to, to verse number, eight, number seven. Thank you. So at that moment when they ate, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame. Say shame. shame. And their nakedness. Say nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And I want to extend that because my time is going up very fast. When the man fell, three things that he has never known happened to him. Number one, he experienced shame. Number two, he experienced nakedness. And I want to add number three. It's in the other verse. He said, it is characterized in his version, and he's speaking it now. He says, I was afraid when I heard you. These three important words, which I don't have time to describe to you what they mean, and, and yeah, I don't have that time, and I've not done a very thorough study. I, I want to do so. As an Old Testament study, I, 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 I take time to see what the scripture says. Because the Hebrew gives us a very different picture from the English. One of the greatest trauma of men is shame. Shame and fear are the greatest enemies of men. And we sit up here today, even we as men, we might be asking ourselves a question. Where are you about our fathers? All men experience shame. So the guy that you are busy asking yourself questions about, 
right now, whether you are a man or you are a woman, but you have a father issue, somebody left you, somebody abused you, somebody mistreated you, somebody left the children, somebody have done something, there. that guy, wherever he is, he may not be saying it, even in the text, it's not the man who is saying, I am shameful. He only says, I'm afraid. But the scripture says he was what? Shameful and naked. He only says one, fearful. And that's the one that they can say. So the man that you are looking for right now is experiencing shame. Is experiencing a sense of nakedness. So I want us in the process of dealing with men, know that men are not in a happy place continuously eating some grapes and enjoying life. Men are at a place of shame. And no one can take out the patch and the guilt of shame than God. No one. No better words can extract the man from where he is. Only God can. Because man is in a state of shamefulness. And this is why as girls, as mothers, as females, and as men who have lost men who should have spoken to our lives, we need to understand this man is in a strange land. We describe a strange land as a place that one gets into, which he has never anticipated to be in. This man called Adam has never thought and has never experienced anything close to shame in his life. Never. He has never felt nakedness in his life. Never. He has never been afraid. I mean, he has been with God and God was his everything. He was provided no insecurities, no whatsoever. And suddenly, shame, nakedness, fear comes in. And if you are a man today, listen to me. God wants to take you out of the cage of shame. Shame can destroy men. Fear can destroy men. And I need to do a study if I had time or write a book to help because I think these three emotions described first in the first book of the Bible as the first experiences of men, I can tell you psychology will come in later to describe them as the fundamental issues that destroys men. Shame. And I thought about it in my own terms. Anthropological approaches. Can I, can I, can I say, can I fear, 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 a business opportunity that fear. Madiala shame. What's more about nakedness, which is an internal feeling of belittling oneself, not seeing yourself with. So the man you are looking for, that's my message today for women, for girls, for everyone. The man you are looking for, it's going through issues. And he's experiencing shame. Some of the shame is about you. He's dealing with shame. He's fearful of what to say to you, how to say it to you. He's very scared of how you would respond. He's dealing with issues. This man was afraid when he heard God ask him, even before God could speak, he said, when the voice of the Lord was working, that's the Hebrew aspect, the voice of the Lord coming, working before it gets in, because faith comes by what? Hearing, and hearing what? The word of God. And the word of God moves and the word of God is a voice. It's, it's, it travels. So when I, when I heard the footsteps of your voice, when I anticipated what you are about to say, I hear. And some of the men, this is why they shut up before you could even ask a question. Where are you? And here's what the man says. He says, that made me afraid. And I know you think about men like big guys who never get scared. We are scared. We are scared of your questions. Because of our mistakes, because of our absence, we are scared of saying how we feel because things have gone wrong at our eyes. And we know we are wrong. And we also know, preferably you don't have the answer for us. 
This man, if you will look at a very strong etymological understanding of the question that God asked, it's a very rhetorical question. Because God says to the man, where are you? Read the text very well. It says, God was asking this question while he was on his way to the man. And he says, where are you? And we ask a very strong biblical question. How do you ask somebody where he is while you are going towards her? Or him? That's what is surprising here. And the study of the text shows us more than that. That God in his question, where are you? He's not asking the physical location. Because he knows it. He's already on his way towards the physical location. He, here's what God is asking. He says, man, I have not created you to be there. Where are you now? How, how is your emotions? Because we recognize the first thing that came, it's shame. And God is concerned today about the emotional level of a male man. I want to ask you today as a man, where are you emotionally? How, how, how do you feel about yourself? How do you feel about your future? How does your mistakes make you feel? Because Adam suddenly felt shame because of the mistake that he had done. How, how does this make you feel? And God is concerned. He says, oh, if I'm going to leave them there, I, there's going to be a problem. Second level that God is interested in, he says, how, how is your thinking? Where, where, where are you at? At a psychological level. How is your thinking after doing this sin? That's what I'm interested in. How, how, and how is your spiritual level? Are you still there? God is interested in different levels. The physical location, he's aware of it. He's coming there. But he wants to make sure that what has just happened, how has it affected your emotions? And I can tell you, there are many men who have been killed by their mistakes. There are many men who have been frustrated by the errors they have did. There are many men who have not outgrown their past because it puts them in shame. And emotionally, physically they are present. Emotionally they are, they are tempted, they are tattered. And no one can help them. No woman can help them. And I'm about to show you the one who can help them. Spiritually, dead. And God is saying, this is why I'm coming. I'm recognizing that you are in a place where if I don't come to you, you'll die. And I think that's the, that's, that's, that's the goodness of this message today. Is that wherever you are, gentlemen, God is not asking a question of where you are seated in a chair. He's coming to where you are. I want to see, see your level of thinking. I want to see how emotional damage you have been. I want to see where you are. I'm coming to you. But let's talk about it. Where are you? How can I help you? Adam thought God is coming in with a lightning stick, ready to kill him. But God was coming to him to say, if you have done this without me, you are gone. Let me come into where you are. And I like the text, the book of Romans, chapter number 5, verse number 19 to 20, says something very important. I want you to follow the logic. It says, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made what? Sinners. Who is that man? Adam. Who is that man? Adam. What did he do? He disobeyed. And what happened to all of us following him? We became what? Sinners. Let's look at what God is doing. So by obedience of one man. Say one man. His name is what? Jesus. Shall all, shall many be made what? Righteous. So there is about to be an exchange in the spirit so that None of us, if you have been hurt by a father, cheated by a man, abused by a man, lived a fatherless life, God does not want you to stay in that status for life. He's sending another man. Give me 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, number 15, verse number 45. Let's see what it says. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became what? A living being. It was only he who was alive. Look at what is happening. The last Adam, he became a life-giving spirit. So that all who have been abused and have suffered the consequences of the first Adam and are calling Adam, where are you? They may be able to experience a life-giving Adam. 
He's not the one who runs away. He's coming to you. He says, where are you at? Are you emotional? Okay. That's Jesus. Our greatest hope of today is Jesus. The second Adam. And I'm here today not to present a condemnation, but to present hope. The second Adam has come. The second Adam comes in to correct the mistakes of the first one. If you are a woman in this place, you are struggling with the hurt of fatherhood, you are struggling with the failures of men in your life, there is a man who never fails. There is a man who never disappoints. There is a man who can hug you. There's a man who can kiss you. There's a man who can be present in your life continuously and never leave. His name is Jesus. If you are a father, you have failed yourself. You have disappointed. Your name is being dragged. You have made mistakes and nothing you do would ever correct that. But here is the hope for you. Is that the guilt, the shame, the nakedness, and the fear that will trap you until you go to sleep can be taken away. Because the second Adam is coming in to help you. He wants to help you. He understands the thoughts you face. He understands the type of emotions you deal with based on your fear. And he says, where are you? Here's the greatest news about him. Jesus says, come unto me. The, the, the God of the old could not say come. He only went. Jesus is saying, I'm coming and I want you to come. And that's what I want us to do too, this morning. He says, come unto me, ye that are heavy, laden. It may be a psychological and emotional and economic one. I don't know when I mentioned the economic. An economic one. Jesus says, I'm the guy. I'm the new guy. I know that the, the last guy disappointed. You know that guy. He blew it up. He couldn't handle you with the care that you did. I know he walked away. I know he couldn't show up in a meeting. I know he couldn't go and take. I'm, I'm the new guy. Knock, knock. The scripture says, behold, I'm standing by the door of every heart knocking. If anyone lets me in. So that's what Jesus is saying. Say, Please, I know you have been hurt by a guy similar to me. Don't rubbish all of us. I am the new guy. Give me a chance. I would love you. I would respect you. I would be present. I would never leave. And all of us here are dealing with issues that a woman, sex, anything, it can never heal you from. It would never. You need him. Because you were disappointed by the first one. You need healing from the second one. His name is Jesus. You need to connect with him for your own sanity, to overcome your own issues, the answer is only one. The second Adam. No other things. Other things are a manifestation of what we are dealing with. And the good news is, this morning, right now, the second Adam is here. He says, I love you. I want you. And here's the good news. He doesn't say, go and fix your mistakes and come to me. He says, come as you are. Because I recognize, without me, you're going to die where you are. I need to save you. And as we end this service, may we all stand. And as we stand, I want to make two important altar calls this morning. The first one is for everyone. Men, women, child. If you want your healing for any past, for any head that I come from an experience with the first Adam, I want you to come in contact with the second Adam this morning for your sanity, for your healing. If that's you this morning, I want you to come to the front. Let's, let's just pray for you. This is an important process. So if that's you, just come. So we pray for you. Yeah. So let's come. Let's come quickly. We don't have time. So we can pray with you. You are coming for your healing. Healing of the wounds. Healing of the whatever that you're going through. Healing of the shame. This is your time. 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 Let's not, let's not take long. We are running out of time. Uh, this is your time. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. 
It's only the second Adam who can heal you. It's the place for us, even as men. Let's come, let's heal. Let's heal. Let's heal. Let's come, let's heal. Let's just come. Let's come, gentlemen. Let's come, let's heal. Let's come, let's deal with our wounds. You don't want to spend your time referring to the wounds of a man who left. Let's heal. The second Adam can come in for you. If you are a man, this is your chance. You can never get this opportunity. Let's come, gentlemen. We are close in this. We want you healed. We want you restored. And no man's words, no, nothing can heal you. You need an encounter with the second Adam. He's the only healer. The scourge of an absent father can haunt you for life. But Jesus can soothe that. We don't know what he does. But he knows how to get into your heart and change it. I'm trying to take time because this is life and death for you. We are giving you a chance. This is our hope. The second Adam to correct how you've been feeling, what has been going on in your life, to take away the shame, to take away the fear, to heal the nakedness, to take you, clothe you, and help you stand. I'm about to close. I don't think we have enough time. I'm going to be asking you guys at the front, this is for you, whatever they had. I want you to confess it to God. I said, God, heal my heart. I'm coming to you for the hurt that was done from, to me. I'm giving it to you. Heal my heart. And I'm coming to you. I just want to lay hands on you and declare the grace of God over your life. But connect in your own space. Just lift up your hands. Begin to talk to God where you are. That the second Adam may come into your life and heal the hands of the first guy. And at the back, you can say a prayer for yourself. Let's just talk to God. La kraba shando lo bosala, siblo bosala la kasinda, ikondo lo bolo 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 daba. Lord, we ask you to heal, restore, restore the fatherhood of the Savior. Just to be close to you, just to be close to you, just to be close to you, he 
It's my desire just to be close to you. I wanna be close to you. I wanna be close to you. It's my desire just to be close to you. Just to be close to you. Just to be close to you is my desire. I wanna be close to you. I wanna be close to you. I wanna be close to you. It's my desire. Just to be close to you. Just to be close to you. Just to be close to you. It's my desire. I wanna be close to you. I wanna be close to you. I wanna be close to you. It's my desire just to be close, just to be close, just to be close to you. It's my desire. I wanna be close. I wanna be close to you. It's my desire just to be close. Just to be close. Just to be close to you. It's my desire. Heal him, Jesus. Restore him. Restore him by the power of the Spirit. Heal him, Jesus. Shalom, Shalom, Shalom. Just connect with God in your own way, right where you are. Just connect with God. Connect with God in your own way, in your own language. Allow the healing to flow through your life. Just take it up. I know we are after time, but let's just allow this healing process. Yes, Lord. While we are in that stage of prayer, it's a very important moment for us to give you a chance. If you don't know the second Adam, you are likely to stay in the frustration of the second Adam you don't know where he is. But this morning you have an opportunity for you to come into an experience with Jesus the Christ, the second Adam. So if you are here, you don't know Jesus as your Lord, and as your savior, this is an important moment for you to make a decision and say, Jesus, I want to make you the Lord of my life. If that's you this morning, 
Just flip up your hand where you are so we can pray with you. You say, I want to give my life to Jesus, the second Adam. Just flip up your hand. We want to pray with you. All over, just if that's you, it's important. You want to come in contact with the second Adam. Flip up your hand. Let's pray for you. It's important. Is there anyone in our midst? this morning I want us to be, have confidence in this guy the second Adam that none of the sins of your fathers none of the failures of your parents none of the failures of your husband will stop you from being what God wants you to be you can overcome the hearts you can ride at a high level and connect with Jesus. A friend who never leaves. He says, I stick closer than a brother. And the scripture says, in his winds, there is healing for every brokenness. Your husband, your, your brother, your father may never care, may never reach out Maybe you'll never be able to see him. But Jesus would have not done it right if he had left you alone. He's well able to heal and to restore and to be there for you that all your dreams would become valid and come to pass and life would turn around as if there was a father in your life. Clap hands for Jesus. He's our hope. So thank you for coming. Have a good weekend. God bless you. Be healed.